organization. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this organization. Uh, it's, uh, it used to be called No Such Agency, the NSA. Um, and um, there's supposed to be a picture up on the screen now. Uh, <laughs> ah, there it is. That's, that's, the, uh, that's as close as we could get to the NSA. Uh, <laughs> That's a, that's a, a photo by uh, our, our resident the photographer, Kyle. Uh, we have the 2013 Hacker Calendar ready. It just came out yesterday, and we have that at the 2600 store. And the theme this year, or the next year, is surveillance. And we went down to Fort Meade, Maryland to take that picture to make um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the pictures for the calendar. Um, and of course we got in trouble for this <laughs> very quickly. Uh, we were surrounded by four NSA police cars. I didn't know there was an NSA police, but there is. And uh, they kept us for about a half hour uh, asking us questions. Oddly enough, they didn't know we were taking pictures. They just wanted to know why we were there, period. Um, and do we have other pictures that we didn't? Uh, yeah, this is, okay, read this sign. There's so many things you can't do, uh, including read this sign if you're driving by. Uh, but just to make it quick, um, uh, unauthorized photography, note-taking, uh, making, making of drawings. Do not make any drawings when you're down there. Uh, maps or other graphic representations, all prohibited. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. And um, uh, taking a picture of this sign is probably forbidden too, although I don't know any other way you would know what you couldn't do. Um, no photographic imagery equipment, media recording, sound. I'm sure it's illegal for all of us to be looking at this right now. But that is, that is what we are faced with when we go down to Fort Meade and, and try to visit the National Security Agency. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, it used to be you could go right up to the buildings, but now you can't get anywhere near them. And uh, if you go close, you will get questioned. Uh, and uh, just, just for fun, uh, there's one other picture we have here. This is actually um, a bunch of sheep in England. But in the distance is um, uh, basically the antenna farm of Menwith Hill. Uh, which is a, a massive receiving station, uh, and uh, those radons, they're basically covering uh, satellite dishes. And the reason they're round is you can't tell where they're pointed. You, you don't know what they're listening to. Uh, but it's an incredible listening post. They, they basically are, are getting just about everything going over the satellites in that part of the world. Uh, but, you know, we, were, we pretended we were taking pictures of sheep. Uh, for a couple of hours and <laughs> got some pretty, um, uh, pretty nifty photography there. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's in the hacker calendar as well for 2013, all about surveillance. Um, but now we have um, a, a keynote speaker that I'm really honored uh, to be introducing here. We've had many heroes speak on this stage over the years. Uh, basically people who stand up to authority, people who question the rules. Uh, people who, um, who face a lot of crap for basically saying what they think is right or, or, or taking an action. And I think that's a model that uh, the whole hacker community should be looking at uh, as, um, as, as something that steers us in future years or in our present day life. Uh, it's all about whether you're in high school or whether you're, you're working for a government someplace or a corporation. If you see something that's wrong, you say something about it or you tell people about it. If you see a security hole, you do something about it. You let the world know or you at least let the people that can fix it know. Many times you'll be blamed. Many times the messenger is confused with the message. And that's why we gather together to share these stories of, uh, of what we've been through. Uh, William Binney worked for the NSA for over 30 years as an analyst. And uh, believe me, he's learned an awful lot in that period of time. Uh, probably was, uh, we, can, we can get rid of that. I don't know if he ever went there, but uh, he, he most certainly was in the NSA buildings uh, that we saw just a moment ago. Um, well, after 9-11, uh, he noticed a change in what the NSA was doing. He saw that the technology was being used against Americans in our own country. And that was too much for him to, uh, to deal with. And he became, instead of an NSA analyst, he became an NSA whistleblower. And I think there's, um, there's nothing more courageous than standing up to such a powerful entity and letting the rest of us know what's really going on. And with that, it's my honor to introduce as our keynote this Friday, William Binney. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the uh, coordinators of HOPE for inviting me here uh, to give me the opportunity to uh, express my uh, story. Uh, some of it was hard to believe. I'm sure 
you'll find some of it difficult to believe. I find some of it difficult myself to be even believe that actually things like this happened and our government did these kinds of things. But um, so I'd like to, what I'd like to do is go through my entire background with NSA and how, how I handled the events in 9-11 uh, after that and, uh, and all the things that uh, happened with the Department of Justice and us after that. Plus, uh, uh, then I'd like to go into some of the technology that uh, is involved in large data and data, database analysis with you, and then um, give you my impression of what uh, the White House's new initiative on big data analysis is really all about, even though they can't say it correctly. This is really what they're asking, um, and I'll try to define that for you, and uh, hopefully that'll give you some idea. It'll certainly give you a better idea, uh, I believe, uh, how uh, these events occurring and how dangerous metadata is uh, to monitoring the entire population. As I've said before in different forums, the KGB, the Stasi, and the Gestapo could never have dreamt of having anything as uh, great or as com comprehensive as this capacity to monitor the population. Their primary uh, focus, they tried to get information about their population so they could control it, and that's fundamentally what dictatorships and totalitarian systems do around the world. And that, unfortunately, is the way our government is going. And um, so I'll try to define what that's all about, the technology behind that, and uh, what they're asking now and in the future. And they're spending hundreds of millions to do that a year, a year here. But let me give you some of my background. Um, uh, I first, uh, I was a hillbilly from central western Pennsylvania and I came out I was a small town guy so I had small town ethics and uh, and uh, of course I hunted so I was a marksman so uh, this was in 1965 I uh, joined the army as opposed to getting drafted and going into a rifle company and being shipped to Vietnam and having to kill somebody I didn't want to do that okay so I volunteered for the army to go to Europe and so they sent me through uh, a bunch of a battery of tests and they said gee you really have a good aptitude for this uh, analysis so I said because uh, I was at a mathematics degree and I was in math my background was mathematics so uh, so I fit right into that so they sent me off doing um, the traffic analysis school which uh, ended up to be I thought it was going to be counting cars going by on the street or something you know <laughs> but uh, it turned out to be uh, analysis of, uh, of data, data systems, and, and uh, codes, and ciphers, and things like that. And that's basically what I ended up doing in the military. And then eventually, uh, NSA got a hold of me after that. And so that started my career. So I spent about four years in the military, and then I went into NSA directly. So, so I ended up with about 37 years of service combined. So my. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. It was, most of it was a lot of fun, I tell you. It was really a lot of fun breaking these puzzles, you know, solving problems and things like that. So, and that's really what I did. I fundamentally started working out with data, looking at data and data systems and how you do that. And, of course, I had the background. So I, and Euclid, uh, by the way, I keep mentioning this. Uh, Euclid had a really nice little theorem uh, back in uh, circa 300 B.C., where he said, you know, this is the fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental theorem of arithmetic that any number greater than one is it can be divided down into primes or products of primes, um, which uh, meant that in data and data systems, when you're looking at some, if somebody's created a data system, you're trying to figure out what that data system is all about. Um, <clears throat> that kind of that that theorem is very helpful because you simply figure out how many possible combinations can be generated. And you say, okay, that's a number. Then you factor it down into its primes and look at the prime combinations and say, okay, those are the optional uh, organizational properties, okay? If it's a matrix kind of thing, you look row, column combinations and things like that. So you, and you look at that as a way of doing diagnostics at the highest level. And then sometimes it gives you, give you, give you the idea of how you can simply go straight forward to a solution. And by organizing it properly, it'll, it'll allow you to see what they're really doing. So. Um, in many cases, it might be their alphabet or powers of 10, you know, things like that, that organizing in pages and structures like that. So, uh, but that was my, my background as an and And throughout, throughout that whole problem, um, uh, I was there during the Tet Offensive, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, I watched all that happen. Unfortunately, that was uh, well known that that was coming. Uh, but 
that wasn't being believed by the military, uh, senior military people. So a lot of people lost their lives there. We lost over 2,000 men, I think, in that offensive. So that kind of made it clear to me that it was important to, in, in, in intelligence production to make sure you could get to these solutions, get them quickly, and get the uh, results of that documented in some sort of reportable form that's understandable by leadership. Um, so that became, uh, that was drilled into me initially as the fundamental driver of, of what was important to do in this business. Uh, and so I'd, I'd go around, and unfortunately at the time, NSA was, got, got so big that it started to have it's structure, you know, managers have to manage something. So uh, what they started to do was break away operations from technical support, meaning uh, engineers and uh, computer folks, people who would build things, make things, uh, uh, and execute things or take operational requirements and translate them into meaningful uh, systems that would handle the, the problem. Um, and when they did that, they broke it away. What that did was it separated NSA into two, real, two camps with two separate priorities. On the, one, on the one hand, operations still had that priority to figure out intentions and capabilities of the potential enemies uh, and report that. And on the other hand, their, their emphasis became a structure of that needed money to function, to build things, they needed money to maintain things, they needed money, meant contracts, they had to support contractors once they got that going. So their emphasis then turned to money as opposed to production of intelligence. So that, that, that separation was probably one of the worst things they could have done, but, and they're still separated, by the way. But so that meant when I had an operational problem, I had to try to figure out who could help me solve it. So I try to go to people in that other operational organizations and, and try to say, you know, I have a problem here. Can you help me? And things like that. Um, and they were all really reluctant to come over into operations. Uh, so number one, if you're if you're a technical person like that, you tend to be over here in operations. You know, this is where people get killed. Okay, this is this is the real world, and over here in op, in in in, uh, in the engineering world and things like that, they can they can have time to to research, to do things like that, to do to do um, uh, try to do development, um, and uh, and basically what they tried to do was large scale development, which was fundamentally the wrong way to do it. I mean. If you try to do everything all at once, sometimes that just doesn't work. And if your assumptions anywhere along the line are wrong, then the whole thing fails, as, as I'll point out in some later programs. Uh, so um, they were all reluctant to come over and help me. So I ended up having to do a lot of it myself. So I'd try to go around anywhere I could in NSA just to get something done. I would, I would try to do that. Uh, but, but then finally, uh, eventually, I found uh, Dr. John T. We're not supposed to mention their last names, okay? So <laughs> I won't mention last names. But he was a good, he's still a good friend of mine. He's retired now, too. But uh, <clears throat> he was in research, and he was trying to do some automation research. Well, that fit right into me because uh, I was developing this concept of um, analysis. It was not an art form. It was a, it was a discipline, maybe not a science, but a discipline that was definable in, in rules and, and had structure to it and order so that you, can, you could lay it out in such a way that it could be coded and executed electronically, meaning you could automate analysis, okay? So that was, the whole, that was my whole theme there at NSA. That was, eventually, that's what I ended up to. I was the only one there doing that, by the way. Um, so uh, I kept trying to find others to try to to help me uh, down through the years, and every time I went somewhere, they were always so, um, they, they didn't want to join me, but they would take my requirement and say, how about writing it up so I can get more money, okay? This, this then requirement would be taken downtown Congress, we need more money because this guy has this requirement, I need to build something for him to solve this requirement, I need a lot of money to do that, so. So that's the way they used me for a number of years, and I finally got wise to them. I, you know, I, I just decided, hey, I'm not going to write any more requirements for that. I'm going to try to go do it myself because you're not really trying to help me. Uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> during that period of time, I ended up, uh, I, you know, I tried to think of things like vision statements to help motivate people to do things like in, in the SIGINT automation research, which we eventually formed, I, I had vision statements like everything all the time. 
okay, aim high and do better. And my envision of, uh, of, their, of their, their vision statement seemed to me to be, at least at that point in time, uh, aim low and miss. <laughs> <laughs> because they consistently failed. I mean, uh, this, this uh, I mean, and we, I mean, in operations, I mean, you were on the line all the time. I mean, uh, you, you weren't, failure was not an acceptable outcome. <laughs> uh, so um, to try to combat that, uh, to, um, to work a way around that, uh, I, I took a, <coughs> a, a, a COR course. Now, that's a contract officer representative course, which meant that I could now run the contracts. So I didn't need all those other people, okay. I would hire my own contractors, run the contract locally, and tell them to do, <coughs> excuse me, exactly what I wanted done, then I'd get, it. I'd get an operational uh, result because I wasn't getting it otherwise. So um, I, started, uh, I started that out, I was running about uh, several programs, one of which uh, I um, <coughs> conveniently, <coughs> I, I tried to, uh, <clears throat> lock NSA into this uh, program. So I, I put together a, an international coalition of about five countries <laughs> and got an agreement signed with them that we would all cooperate in this uh, program. So that kind of locked NSA in once I had that agreement signed. <laughs> and they didn't realize what was happened by the time it was signed. It was too late. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but, but the whole idea was to share everything. And because we were all in a joint effort, it was a joint uh, uh, effort against the, the Soviet Union and, and any other international threats that threatened not just this country, but you know, our allies and friendly countries uh, around the world. So, <clears throat> so I got that program running and, uh, and set up a, even a, I set up a multi-source uh, or a multi-country uh, uh, network web, if you will, so we all get on the web and we would update our latest technical developments right there and everybody would have them at launch. You know, it was a complete sharing process, even internally in NSA, they could look at them if they wanted to. So, <coughs> and, uh, so uh, that was going along pretty well and then we decided, gee, we need to do this on a much larger scale because the problems were so much, so much larger than just this, these simple areas I was attacking. So uh, <coughs> John Taggart, Sorry, don't scratch that name. <laughs> John and I, uh, <laughs> it's not as bad as CIA. You know, CIA, you get a totally different name. <laughs> Here, they just cut off your last name. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but, uh, so we started the, <clears throat> we started the SIGIN Automation Research Center um, by pulling together multi-disciplines. Uh, we got everybody in the same room, basically. So where we were all working together, computer people, engineers, and so on. So we'd have a, we'd have a problem, we'd say, here's the engineering part of it, and this is the problem that you're really focusing on. So they knew what they were really contributing to, instead of being in isolation over in the side, working in a little box. Because when you created those little boxes, people didn't get out of their boxes. You know, they stayed in their box. So they didn't really understand the enterprise approach. So by pulling the disciplines together, we got that perspective of the enterprise. And that was the focus. Uh, <clears throat> so we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to do that on a much larger scale in NSA. And, and the focus there was on automating analysis because that was the driver of everything. Because the analytic parts, when you make a breakthrough in, an, <clears throat> in the analytic part, in one part of the enterprise, you can leverage that across the entire enterprise and, make, uh, and help successes in other, <clears throat> other environments. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, so uh, when we uh, got that SARC going, we uh, started uh, doing some uh, wild and crazy things, to say the least, uh, which I thought would fit in here perfectly. Uh, out, of the, out of the box kind of thinking, and uh, also we took no legacy inputs at all. Anything that was uh, existing was to us legacy, and we therefore said that, uh, well, we're gonna start from scratch and figure out the best way to do it and not adopt, because the existing system wanted you to adopt their legacy approach, because if you, if, if you had a good idea that everybody wanted to support, that meant you got money, okay? 
So these people over here wanted the money. So they said, okay, well, what, what we need to do is you need to be dependent on our legacy system. So we make you in a structurally dependent to that legacy system. That way you have to feed us to keep going. So they take some of your money that way. So that was their entire, so I wised up to that one pretty quickly. You know, I, I was, uh, <clears throat> it was pretty clear to me what they were doing. Uh, and Congress also picked up on that. That was the point. And this really got us in trouble, you know, because when Congress found out what the, some of the things we were doing, they started to support us with budget plus-ups directed directly to us. <laughs> now, uh, I don't know if you know, but if, the budget process is probably pretty, pretty uh, ambiguous or obscure to everybody in the country, but uh, there's a whole markup process that goes through every year, uh, fiscal year, one October on. Uh, so you have, your markups are usually done in the um, but by early summer, they're done, and they're in, under review up to that point, and then they, they start executing the budget in October. Um, so <clears throat> those uh, budget plus-ups were um, in addition to the requested money from, by the administration. So this was above and beyond what they were asking for, uh, and they were directed at us. <laughs> so, so we became very noticed there as getting money from Congress. Uh, in fact, I, at one point I had a couple of million directed to me personally by name, and I didn't even ask for it. So they, but they were, what they were doing was trying to stimulate us to do more crazy and wild things. You know, to, so I, I did some of those, uh, but, we, but uh, one of the things was um, um, I wanted to work in, and, and I'll show you in a technology where I try to work it in, was uh, latent semantic indexing where you would take uh, text and uh, look at text and try to assess it uh, relative to other text and see how it, uh, if it related. And the, the idea was to cluster rela related text so you could begin to analyze common, common uh, or related text and who was sending them and what they were saying. So um, I tried to do that with about, uh, it was, I took about 486,000 and tried it on one case and said, uh, okay, um, let's just try it here. And um, when I got it set up on a, on a computer there for me, I said, okay, here's 10,000 items. You know, this is a small number, okay. Uh, this is just a little chunk to see how it would deal with a little chunk. Well, it came back and the clusters were all of the screen. There was absolutely no distinction in the clusters at all because uh, that told me there were several problems with the uh, uh, latent semantic indexing. One, one I discovered simply by looking at it, and because when they start uh, putting together matrices of words and, and comparing the matrices and things like that, there's one dimension they forgot. That's the dimension of the, uh, of the uh, meanings, the multiple meanings of the words. If they match a word, it doesn't mean, it doesn't say it necessarily has the same meaning in context, okay? So it, it might be the first, second, or third meaning in the dictionary of the word in one case, it's, and it might be a totally different one in another case. So, um, <clears throat> so it missed that dimension of word combinations. But also, the other real problem, and because we were looking at billions of things, is <clears throat> random probabilities of combination across multiple items of, um, and on a large scale hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of items. It's just that no matter where you look, any word will, or any, any, any context will have a, a relationship to some other text out of those billions. And conversely, the ones that it matches will have other relationships and so on, so that they fold back on themselves and the probability is that you will find no distinction whatsoever on a large scale. So that meant that they had to do something to reduce the problem to a manageable level where the meaning, where the latent semantic indexing would have some meaning. And I'll show you how we did that here. Um, and how, it, uh, how, in my view, it needs to be done for the future. So, but continuing when, with our SARC, we started to look at, uh, yeah, this was into the 90s, and uh, we said, well, gee, with the, inter with the wor World Wide Web and the Internet coming along, we have a real problem here with this. And I'm, I'm talking about about 16 people total. And we were run running like four separate, five at some one, one time or another, programs. So we, with those 16 people, you know, some of them were working on multiple programs. So uh, well, it's a very small set of people. We, were, we didn't take any crap, you know. <laughs> We didn't give any, we didn't ask for any, but we asked, what we did was, we needed blunt, honest, straightforward talk. 
and exchange of knowledge of different disciplines. And we, we weren't hiding, we're building anything. All we, our entire objective was to solve the problem. So when it came to the internet, that's exactly what we did. And, and um, I'll show you how big data analysis will, will be able to show, show you how that works and how you can do that, how you can look at uh, terabytes of data passing by you on a continuing basis um, <clears throat> and see what's in it without actually looking at what's in it. And it has to do with metadata and using metadata relationships. So, but uh, <clears throat> so the when we'd solved that problem, uh, the NTO, which is the which an NSA transition office at the time, was uh, they were running all these multi-billion-dollar transition programs. So they they knew we were doing. In fact, the guy who was in the chief there was a friend of mine. Um, and he, he sent his deputy down and said, uh, what could you guys do with uh, $1.2 billion? And we're sitting there, we, you know, we, well, look, you know, this is, you know, this is, uh, I mean, what are we supposed to do with $1.2 billion? Okay, well, uh, let us, give us a few days, we'll look at it and see what we could do. And we took a few days and we said, uh, uh, gee, we could uh, we could upgrade the entire world, every 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 place we have, and you know even everything back here in the states and everything, but we we can only spend about 300 million of that. <laughs> well, I mean, they went back and they said, gee, this is really great, you know, and they, they started going downtown briefing and saying, well, this is really what we should be doing, you know, and. Uh, at the same time, there was a separate issue with uh, a program called Trailblazer. They wanted to start a program. It was, there was nothing existed there at the time, so, but it was a planned program for development. So we were coming into conflict with that. Um, and um, so uh, also what we were coming into conflict with was the, uh, what I referred to as the feasting by the corporations that were leeches on the side of NSA and other agencies of the government. Um, I referred to that uh, process of uh, government feeding all of these corporations as the military-industrial com happiness management complex. You know, they were keeping each other happy. They would retire from government to go to the work for those corporations. The corporations would send people in to manage that programs, and they'd get the contracts back to feed some more. It was all a feasting program, and it's still going on. I mean, that's why we have, uh, that's why we have such a large debt. Uh, at <clears throat> any rate, uh, shortly after they were briefing that downtown at the NTO office that they were planning on doing this with us, uh, the chief of the NTO uh, was fired <laughs> because he didn't conform to the corporate position, uh, which was to feed, feed the corporations that existed on the side of NSA. And I mean, it's just, uh, so uh, what they did was, uh, in order to correct the problem, NSA management brought in uh, and hi hired them on directly to take over the NTO, which is a senior executive position. Uh, they hired a vice president of SAIC to come in and manage that. Now, a consequence of that, you know, it's what, what happened was, of course, the, that, that meant that SAIC got some large chunks of contracts, which they did. <clears throat> um, <laughs> And of course, at the same time, NSA management transferred uh, the SARC to the same organization, the same man. So he was managing all of that. And the first thing he did, he calls me up to his office, and um, uh, he, he said, the first thing he said to me in the office there was, I don't want you briefing ThinThread, which was our program to do the World Wide Web, to anyone anymore. Uh, that's because it was showing success, and he didn't want success being showed because that means you've solved the problem. That means they don't have the problem to ask for the money to get the feeding for all the corporations. You know, it's a circle. It just keeps going round and round. But that's the process that's still going on right now. Um, and unfortunately, that was it. So that basically told me, you know, um, the way I put it here is the, the forces of evil are too numerous here. So I, I said I was going to resign. There wasn't anything I could do internally in NSA. The entire leadership of NSA was focused this way, and they, weren't, they wanted no, no creativity, no innovation, no problems solved. They wanted to 
as I came up with a later version of their vision statement, they, they wanted to keep the problem going so the money keeps flowing. That was their new, vi that was their vision statement all along, I just didn't realize it. You know, I was this naive hillbilly from the hills of Pennsylvania thinking operations was important and instead it was the money and the flowing and the feeding and the feasting. So, <clears throat> so I basically at that point announced my retirement, I was leaving and that was the, about July of uh, 2001. Um, and then, um, uh, so I was at that point, from there on, I wasn't sharing anything internally with NSA. I was uh, cleaning up all my papers. I had, to, you know, I had a whole, whole, whole kinds of things I had to pass off to the archives and different people internally in NSA so they could keep them from, for the records. For hey, Well, here's how this solution worked, you know. It was actually penciled out. It wasn't done in the computer, you know. The point is the miracles don't happen in the computer. They happen in your mind and you relate them on paper and you could see them on paper, and then, then you build the programs to manage them. Um, so, I mean, uh, computers can do cer a certain amount, but uh, fundamentally the trick is to get, the, get your mind wrapped around the problem to where you can understand it to the point where you can see into it and begin to break it apart and solve it. So, <clears> at <throat> any rate, 9-11 happened, and uh, so I started thinking, uh, gee, you know, I, maybe I should reconsider retiring because I'd want to, I, I always wanted to do something positive like stop the bad guys, even, even though there was all this corruption around me, you know. Um, but uh, it must have been uh, right after, a few days, no more than a week after 9-11, uh, that they had decided to begin actively uh, spying on everyone in this country. Um, and they were doing it by taking um, billing data from telecoms. But what I didn't know at the time was the, in February of 2001, uh, they had already started requesting that data from different telecoms. Uh, this is when um, the CEO of Quest uh, refused them and he went into court and testified to that, and that he was approached by some three-star general out of NSA to provide uh, customer data. Uh, but that was in February of 2001. Well, the point was that we had put our system together all from end to end and had it functioning in November of 2000. So this is three months after that. Which meant that they wanted that back part of our program to run all the spying. All right, so <clears throat> that's, that's exactly what they did. So then they started taking the telecom data and it expanded after that. So. I mean, the one I knew was AT&T, and that one provided 320 million records every day. That was just phone calls. And then when they got the taps in, like the ones in San Francisco, they started the nearest devices to take, uh, take the data off the internet. <coughs> so what I did after that was, uh, I was naive enough to think that the uh, government would really, if, if, if people in certain positions of the government knew this was going on, that they would take some action to correct it or at least bring it back into some constitutional form of, uh, or some process that was constitutionally acceptable. You know, so uh, I, I kept, I, I went to, first I went to the House, Senate, uh, the House uh, Intelligence Committee, the HIPSI, and the staff member that I personally knew there, and, uh, and uh, she then went to, uh, Porter Goss, who was the chairman of that committee, and also uh, Nancy Pelosi, who was the deputy, or the um, minority rep. Uh, they were all briefed into the program at the time, by the way, uh, and all the other programs that were going on, including all these CIA programs. Um, and they re Porter Goss referred her to uh, uh, General Hayden out at NSA. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's going back to the origin of this program. So, and he went out there, and of course, he talked. To, she talked to him, and he he said, of course, uh, we don't have to worry about that now. It's all been approved by the White House, and it's legal. So, so spying on everybody then was legal internally. It was all written up in uh, memos by you and I guess others, held in uh, 
In fact, I know the, uh, the uh, NSA lawyer went down to uh, Addington's office in, in Cheney's, who was right outside of Cheney's office. He, Addington was his uh, legal uh, rep there. And he asked for the memos that uh, uh, said that the spying was legal. So he'd have a written record documentation so that his ass wasn't on the line, you know. <laughs> Uh, and he never got it, of course. Uh, because if he got anything like that, and I don't think anything like that was written, because that would be direct evidence for impeachment. So, but they didn't do that, so. And they didn't get the records, so they kept going, and, and that program was reauthorized every 45 days by the, what I call the Yes Committee, which was Hayden and Tennant and the DOJ. So uh, shortly after that, I mean, I went from there. I went to, we, Kirk, there, I wasn't alone in this, by the way. There were like, there were four others out of NSA and uh, one staff from uh, the HIPSI, one member of the staff. We were all trying to work internally in the government for over these years, trying to get them to come around to being constitutionally acceptable and take it into the courts and have the courts oversight of it, too. Um, so we, we naively kept thinking that that could, uh, that could happen, and uh, it never did. In fact, even now, they're trying to keep all these issues out of the court. That's why I signed the affidavit for EFF to, to help to testify. I wanted to testify in court about all this stuff. Uh, because, in my mind, uh, these people are still uh, hiding behind this, quote, national security curtain. And all I want to do is move that aside and say, see, don't, pay, any don't pay, pay attention to that man behind the curtain because he's affecting you. He's affecting every one of us. I mean, uh, in my mind, we're, slippery, uh, we're going down a slippery slope towards totalitarianism. And that's why I told Jim Bamford that I thought we were about that far from a totalitarian state. At least everything is set to make that, turn that key and have that happen. Uh, because the government's now intimidating people in different ways. And, you know, they had this, uh, they had this uh, thing about uh, being able to pick you up off the street and then charge you with things and keep you isolated from no, you would get no due process and things like that. That was, uh, that's just been found, of course, unconstitutional, which it is. And everything they're doing is unconstitutional. That's why they're trying to keep the EFF lawsuit off out of the Supreme Court, because at that point, it'll be, they're afraid it'll be ruled unconstitutional, and their whole house of cards will fall. That's really what's driving them. But at any rate, after that and all the stuff we were doing, uh, they decided to uh, raid us to keep us quiet, threaten us, you know. So we were raided uh, simultaneously, four of us. Uh, the, we, we, by the way, I did, forgot to mention, we did sign a uh, the complaint to the DOD IG's office about all the corruption in NSA and about all, the, all this feeding. I mean, uh, they provided a hotline that said, uh, you know, if you see waste, fraud, and abuse, you're supposed to report it here. This is government policy. So I thought, okay, well, let's do it. So, so we did. And of course, they sent the FBI to uh, visit us. In my case, they came in with guns drawn. I don't know why they did that, but they did, so. I mean, it didn't, I mean, like I said before, I've been shot at. Uh, mostly, I haven't told anybody, but most of, the, most of the time that I was shot at was by deer hunters when I was out hunting in Pennsylvania woods. And the guys coming down were from New York. <laughs> I mean, they would shoot at anything. And I would hear these bullets come on by my head, you know, I, let me get out of here. I said, I didn't shoot back because uh, I wouldn't miss, you know. I <laughs> so, so anyway, right after we got raided, by, uh, they uh, came in and took our computers and everything. And, <clears throat> and then over, the, over time, they wanted to keep us continually quiet. This raid, by the way, happened the day after, the, the, the second morning after um, Attorney General Gonzalez's testimony to the Senate and the Judici Judiciary Committee where he was testifying to these uh, surveillance programs and uh, the, what he referred to as the TSP, Terror Surveillance Program, which was a bunch of programs. 
Um, and the one that we were talking about spying on Americans, everybody in this country was called Stellar Wind, and he never, he never addressed that one at all. So they were afraid that we would go to that committee and tell them what he never told them. So they wanted to keep us quiet in that way, too. Um, that was why they, they raided us right after his testimony, because they realized that uh, we had had a history of visiting committees, you know, and well, since we knew what the program was all about, we were probably would take a shot at the Judiciary Committee, since none of the other committees were paying any attention. So uh, anyhow, <laughs> that was a, that was a, uh, an experience, but uh, it didn't, I mean, after, I didn't, it didn't scare me. What it did was make me mad, all right? I was getting mad while they were still there. In fact, I got so mad I accused them of being sent there by somebody else, and that uh, you know, and then I, and I said, the reason you're really here is you wanted me to keep quiet about stellar wind, and here's what this program does: spying on all Americans, taking all the data in, and I'm explaining this to them on my back porch, and I'm doing it. Because the head agent there, um, special agent Paul Marek, who signed the affidavit with a bunch of lies to get the judge to sign it. Little did the judge know, right? Uh, and we're still we're dealing with that. Um, being quiet is not one thing I'm going to do, by the way. I will not, not sit here and acquiesce to this. Well, and, I, and I'm not alone, so I, I, you need to know that. There are other people who are with me, there are like five of us uh, who came with that. And then we ran into people who, uh, downtown of Washington, GAP and the EFF and the ACLU, and we're dealing with, and we're cooperating with all of them, trying to help them too. So, um, so we aren't alone. There's a large community out there, which we didn't know at the time, because we, I mean, I was a back, back room guy from NSA who broke code. You know, I came out, and gee, what's the world really about out here, you know? So... This is all new to me. It took me a while to figure this out, but, uh, but I wasn't going to sit by and let the FBI do what they were doing, so, so I uh, accused them of many things at my house when they'd been. Before they left, they had to have a meeting outside my house because none of the other... See, I caused them a problem when I, when I exposed this highly classified program to all these agents who weren't cleared, okay? <laughs> so they have a problem now. And the head agent was the only one who was cleared. Now, he, you know, he took an oath to defend the Constitution, too. But he wasn't living up to his oath. And I, as I've said before, neither are any people in Congress or anybody in the administration. They're all violating our constitutional rights. So that's why I'm... That's why I'm uh, standing up and saying these things, because I, you know, I just can't let it pass. I mean, these people are basically cowards. I mean, this guy, when I was explaining this to all these other agents, the only thing he could do was look at the floor. I mean, I was watching, I watched the body language, everything, you know, that I read more into body language than anything else, so. Um, so it was pretty clear to me that he was ashamed of what he was doing, but he was still doing it. And I told him the Nuremberg, of, you know, defense doesn't work. Following orders is not, uh, you know, not acceptable. So, uh, so then after that, I decided, well, I mean, we lawyered up right after that raid so that, uh, and our lawyers are sitting there, you have to be quiet, don't say anything, you know, they'll use it against you, stuff like that. You know, and he, so he was really a strong advocate for, and he was an ex-prosecutor, so he was, he was a, uh, he was a, a strong advocate of saying nothing so that, uh, you know, didn't, you didn't give am, ammunition to the prosecution. Well, there wasn't any ammunition to give him, except the stuff I would talk about would be things they'd have to drag me into court uh, for, and charge me with would be exposing the crimes they were committing. Right? So I thought that would be a good idea. <laughs> Let them do that. So at any rate, uh, that was uh, up, up until 2010. Then in 2010, they decided that, that well, they threatened us with, uh, uh, they gave, made one last threat for prosecution against us. Uh, it had to do with our Turf Valley Club uh, meeting. And uh, in the tur under, at the Turf Valley Club, why, uh, we had all, uh, all the people who were, they were 
interested in, uh, met. What we were trying to do was to address how to, how to solve and, and how to approach the solution of uh, Medicare Medicaid fraud. Um, and the FBI, after their raid, they raided us shortly after that, and uh, that was, uh, and they had, that, what that gave them was all the, I mean, of course not that they already didn't have all the e emails and everything we were sending back and forth, but in the email we listed the agenda of what we were going to discuss and, uh, and a cooperation paper and all that, which we took off the web, by the way. They called it a conspiracy paper, which was taken directly off the web, so I guess the web is a conspiracy uh, center or something. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they were planning on, on uh, doing that, and so I, I uh, and our lawyer told that they were planning on indicting us on that Turf Valley Club meeting, and I, you know, I figured they had all the evidence, why are they doing that? You know, I said, well, it's a malicious prosecution is the charge. Okay, so I figured, this is when, this is when I, I explained this on Democracy Now!, I, I, uh, I said, well, I know, t I know Tom Drake's phone is tapped, okay, because he's been indicted already. Uh, so I'm going to call Tom and tell him all the evidence that we have <laughs> about uh, malicious prosecution that they're trying to get against us on this Turf Valley Club meeting. So I called up Tom and I listed all this stuff, you know. And I figured the FBI couldn't find the data, so I said, well, when you go into the file, you know, you click on the file and you <laughs> go down to properties, you know, and and yeah, so I had to explain it over the phone to Tom. Tom didn't say anything. I think he understood what I was doing. But uh, <laughs> so after that happened, though, we never heard about the Turf Valley Club again. <laughs> so then the DOJ decides they're going to offer us letters of immunity. That was uh, Kirk, Weeby, and I. So uh, they le offered us letters of immunity under the condition that uh, that we would be honest and tell them everything that we discussed at lunches with, uh, with Tom Drake, because we had lunches with Tom after he got raided too, because we were friends, you know. And just because somebody gets raided by the FBI doesn't make them a non-friend, you know. So we weren't going to throw them away just because of that. So, uh, so uh, and our lawyer kept, I mean, I will tell you what I told our lawyer, he said, they want to talk to you, and so they'll give you letters of immunity. And I said, you tell those bastards to go piss up a rope. <laughs> and he said, no, here's a way to, here, this is, you know, he finally convinced me. He said, well, you know, if you do this, so you're off the hook, and it's all done with, and they will never come back. And I said, so I said, okay, so um, I couldn't pass up the opportunity, you know, because when I went to meet these guys, one was the uh, prosecutor, Welsh, who was the same prosecutor in the Stevens, Senator Stevens case. Uh, he's also the prosecutor in Tom's case. And he was also, uh, he came in and took over from another prosecutor uh, um, who was threatening to indict us on that at Turf Valley's thing. So uh, there were, he was there, and then an uh, FBI person was there, uh, a woman, and then a man who, uh, he, no, he kind of, he tried to, tried to stay, he was with the FBI, but I knew he was from Q2, Q2 from NSA, you know, so. Uh, so the three of them were there, and, and uh, I started off saying, you know, because uh, I, I wanted to make it clear how I felt about them. I said, you people do not know how pissed off at you I really am. You know, and then, you know, and then we got into asking questions, and I would answer their questions, and I said, and then I got into saying random things like, you know, I was really irritated at all the laws that NSA was breaking, you know, and, and this idiot on the end from Q2 said, what laws are those? Well, you know, that was my opening, you know, I, 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 just, I just had to lay them all out, uh, including the Constitution. And all he could do at the end of that was look at the prosecutor, and no, none of them could say a word. That's why I say they're all cowards. Sunlight is the solution to these things. And so that's why I'm trying to do that. Thanks. And to do that, I ran into people like Jane Mayer of The New Yorker and Laura Poitras here and Jim Bamford and others who are trying to, trying to help the, expose what's been going on here. So. Like I say, uh, I think that uh, 
Uh, President uh, Reagan had it right. We're a country with a government, not the reverse. And I'd like to see it stay that way. Thanks. <laughs> now, now I'd like to take you into a little bit of the technology. This is the fun part. <laughs> so, you may be interested in this. I don't know. Uh, uh, Emmanuel slash Eric has the copies. Uh, if you want copies, you're welcome to them. I don't. So these were the uh, today's approaches. You know, uh, they would everybody would create their own file, so everybody'd have all kinds of different files. You know, a time some would be real time, some wouldn't. Some, you know, and. Uh, in, in many cases, they would say, well, we can't ingest all this data. Okay, so throw all that away and we'll take in this. We won't even look at it, just throw it away. So, so and R, RDBM, right? relational databasing schemes. Uh, the problem with relational databasing schemes when you're dealing at the terabyte per minute rates or fiber optic rates is it's hard to index and keep up with the rate coming in. It's, it starts to back up and fall apart. So we went with absolute flat files. The whole, the whole way, the best way we saw to do it was B plus tree indexing in flat file, quick index, quick lookup, you know, fast decision making right away. So that was that gets into that. <clears throat> yeah, they are, their content queries can be. Uh, the, the point is we didn't. You can't look at it like a Google query. If you do a Google query, you'll get, you know, you can get millions of returns. And there may be something in there that you want, but you can't really tell. So that's not really a good query. And that was really focusing on basically a series of words or content scanning um, or indexing that form. Whereas we wanted, to, we wanted to be able to look into the data without actually looking at the content. We wanted to save that till the end. All right, we'll look at content at the very end of our selection process. So, the next slide, please. Yeah. So, we looked at, uh, these are the kind of the requirements, although they rarely state them this way, you know. That's because they really, they, they, they have a very difficult time um, expressing what their real requirements are. Because you have to know what the problem is to do that. Right, that's unfortunate. So, but you can, you can read through these and see that, uh, you know, some of these are pretty straightforward, obvious things, you know. It's not, not very complicated. Okay, next slide. So, this gets into um, automating analysis is really the underlying theme here. Get, making a system that's smart enough to be able to figure things out. You know. Uh, these slides, by the way, are about 12 years old. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I'm sorry. They're not 12. They're eight years old. <laughs> so, you know, this is not a current problem. I haven't been at NSA for 10 years, and I haven't had a clearance since 2007, so we haven't been working anywhere near any of this stuff since then. So. But the problems haven't changed, as if you read the latest uh, uh, White House uh, Big Data Initiative, they're asking for the same things right here. But they don't say it that way, okay. Next slide. This is, uh, we, we use this all along, this is right off the web. This was a picture of the web. Uh, someone made this up, I don't know who did it, but um, this is basically a physical connection, not the, what we call a logical connection, which is, which is who's communicating across the network. These are the the physical fiber optic lines, satellites, wires, things like that, that all that, all that communication transits on. But you can see that each little dot's maybe uh, 10,000 computers or something, you know. <laughs> I don't know how many, but it's just a way of visualizing the network. But you can see choke points and things like that. Well, those are where you want to go for all the grasping of all the data. So, next slide. Yes, this is my favorite one. The, they said they kept saying, you know, volume, velocity, and variety. And this is what they used in Congress to get all the money. Is the real problem? We can't handle this anymore. And I said, gee, this is everything here is positive. You know, volume, you get more about your target. Velocity, you get it faster. Variety, you get more aspects. So this is all positive. 
why are we saying this is a problem? <laughs> well, it was to get money, you know, and do the feeding and continue the process in the circular. You know, I'm, I, I'll retire, come over your way, you can hire on to me or something, you know. Next slide. So this is kind of the uh, idea of how you um, put together an ingest of data.